Okay, we're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 13. So I told us that, you know, uh, his, his writing is now a little mixed up. Um, so once again, the uh, beginning of Hebrews 13 is instruction to the community of believers. So he says, let brotherly love continue. Now brotherly love here, the Greek there is filio. Filio is like a friendly affection for one another. Uh, so he says that that's how the, the believing community should be, isn't it? That we truly enjoy one another, we truly care for each other, and uh, uh, you know we have that brotherly love for each other. Let it continue. Don't uh, uh, let that stop. Do not forget to entertain strangers. Now, this is a um, instruction to the believers at that time because apparently the inns, you, you remember the inn that uh, even uh, Joseph went around looking for an inn to uh, deliver the baby Jesus. They didn't find a, a place. It was all full. So similarly, for the traveling ministers of God, uh, it was hard to find inns uh, and, you know, also it was apparently not very safe because many immoral things would happen in these places. So it, were, it was better for these ministers to stay with believers. So in any city, town, village, the ministers would um, be given a choice, you know, like they could actually stay with believers from that particular place. So he encourages these Jewish believers and he tells them that uh, you need to be hospitable. Okay, so uh, entertain strangers, entertain strangers. Now he's also saying strangers uh, because he is referring back to the times when you had people like Abraham and Lot. Uh, they they were talking to strangers, but they ended up being angels. So uh, to have that heart, but of course you know you discerning, be discerning, and if you sense that. There are strangers whom God wants you to host, be welcoming. So he says, uh, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Then he says, remember the prisoners as if chained with them. So this again you know, is uh, the way we look at the body. We speak about the body with the many parts. If one part is suffering, then all the other parts are suffering. So these are uh, words written to people going through persecution. Okay, remember that. So that is the reason he is talking about prisoners. Maybe there were some believers who were taken as prisoners. But he didn't want these believers to forget them. So he says, please remember them. Okay, uh, as if we were chained with them or empathy, feel the pain which they are uh, feeling. Um, and also those who are mistreated. So when we look at believers who are being ill-treated around us, what should be our attitude? Ignorance? We can say, uh, we are safe. You know, where we are, there's not nothing much going on. We can continue to do the work of the ministry. But... Yes, we have some privileges at the moment, but whenever we hear news of somebody is persecuted, somebody is going through uh, opposition, our heart must really go out for them. We must feel for their pain and we must think, how can we be of support to them? Maybe we don't have anything to give financially, but we can, of course, pray. We can uh, do whatever is possible in our capacity. So. Think, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body also. So basically empathy, have empathy for those who are suffering. Then he goes on uh, again. These are all aspects of you know community life, Christian um, uh, walk, how to do life. The, those instructions. Now he is talking about marriage. So he says, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. For but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. 
so he emphasizes the uh, sanctity of marriage and he says that you no know, god is the one who has instituted marriage so it is an honorable thing it shouldn't be treated lightly you know you just uh, unfortunately in the current society that we live in uh, it is taken very lightly mm, however that's not the christian standard marriage is honorable uh, and it is honorable among all so the way god upholds marriage even believers must uphold marriage and they must respect it then uh, it it says in continuation and the bed undefiled so basically it is talking about uh, the um, you know the boundaries of the act of marriage which is uh, sexual love which should be within you know a marriage relationship and that is the way god has meant for it to be anything outside of that is immoral and uh, uh, he says that fornicators i already mentioned to us fornication is that uh, you know having that sexual intimacy without marriage without you know marriage uh, that is not right it's called as fornication and uh, god it's we are told that god will judge fornicators we are also told that adulterers adulterers okay adulterer is what adulterer is somebody who does not honor the marriage relationship so though they are married they try to find you know uh, sexual intimacy outside of the boundaries of marriage and both of these are wrong fornication adultery they are wrong and there is a warning we are told that god will judge okay, it's a way of saying that um, be ready to face you know god's wrath if you do not honor marriage as an institution uh um, initiated by god and also the marriage bed which is the sexual intimacy which is within the boundaries of marriage then you know, he uh, moves forward and addresses another aspect of christian living he says let your conduct be without covetousness okay what is covetousness covetousness is uh, wanting what others have you know it's a uh, it's not a, a positive desire it's a negative thing if you remember at the time of jezebel and ahab you know, they they wanted the vineyards that another person had so they were willing to go to the extent of killing that individual which was not uh, which was not right in god's sight god became very angry that they tried to take away what belonged to another person that is covetousness in a negative way wanting what somebody else has so as believers we should not have that attitude you know we see each other we see people around and mm, i want it you know i will take it from them we shouldn't have that sort of an attitude that's not a godly attitude then be content with such things as you have so instead what kind of attitude should one maintain the attitude says okay thank you god for what you have given me uh, you know i i basically uh, enjoy steward those things well and i'm not trying to uh, get what others have that is contentment okay so they have that kind of an attitude for he himself has said i will never leave you nor forsake you so we may boldly say the lord is my helper i will not fear what can man do to me so simply i know we are being told here that because god is in this case our provider our father he said i will never leave you i will never forsake you so because of who god is and what he said we have to resonate with that what what should be our response our response when we are going through you know life maybe we are comfortable or going through a lack we can still say you know uh, god is my helper i don't have anything to fear what can man do to me so that is our confidence which we maintain so based on who god is there is a response that the believer should have and there's also a confession that a believer should have uh, and that is what is being talked of here so god has uh, already revealed to us in his word that he is jehovah jireh the lord our provider so we can be confident that we are well taken care of 
So he tells the believers that maybe at that time, uh, because of persecution, they felt that um, everything is being taken away. So that's the reason he's telling them, no, don't be discouraged. You know, remember that whatever you need, you will have because it's uh, ultimately God who is your provider. In verse 7, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. So this is again about Christian um, community. And we know that in Christian community, in the church, we have leaders, okay, elders. Um, now he's talking about godly, godly authority. He's saying, remember those who rule over you. So the, the reference is to godly authority. And he says, so what should be the responsibilities of, uh, you know, godly leadership? They speak the word of God, isn't it? So it's their responsibility to teach what God's word says so that people's lives can be aligned to what God's instruction is and whose faith you follow. Wow, that is again a leadership lesson right there. Leadership is not about telling people what to do. It's about doing the right thing so in this case you know, he says whose faith you follow so the leader should first have faith and the leader should first be walking in faith then what happens to the disciple or the follower they just follow huh the way this person is uh, has faith i want to be like that you know, i want to have that kind of faith so there is an inspiration there is a mm, drawing their hearts towards doing the right thing. So that is true leadership. So he says that we must remember such leaders who have taught God's word, who have led with an example of holding on to their faith. And he says, consider the outcome of their conduct. These are all very important things. So conduct is our behavior, you know, our behavior, our lifestyle, which is a product of our character. So uh, good leaders will demonstrate good character, good behavior, you know, um, the way what we discussed earlier, you know, holiness, reverence, godly fear. So all that is part of their conduct. Now, as followers, you know, we have to not just look at what is spoken. Sometimes it's so easy. We can come and we can just say something and go away and nobody will know about the life of the person, isn't it? And that's where problems happen, that there is inconsistency in the uh, stage life and there is uh, inconsistency, you know, in the real life. So real life is different and uh, stage life, pulpit life is different. So that's very, very dangerous. And uh, you see the apostles earlier, they understood that um, the conduct of the leader, you know, their way of demonstrating faith, all this is very important. That's why when Paul writes to Timothy, you would see that he gives instructions. Leaders should be like this. You know, they should have a good example. You know, they, they should have a righteous walk with the Lord. Uh, so many things, isn't it? They, they, the way they manage their house. So a lot of instructions are given to the uh, uh, when you are going to choose a pastor or a leader. So the people in the church they are instructed. You don't just follow their uh, what is being spoken, but try to follow people whose lives are a testimony of uh, you know what what god is doing so he says you should remember them remember those who rule over you or those who are leading you those who have spoken the word of god to you whose faith you follow so they have set an example and these people have also lived a life uh, uh, before you a good godly life before you so don't forget such people and then you know he has more instructions instructions of worship he says jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever so it's a uh, 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 an encouragement again for the believer to say that you know jesus has not changed now we are talking about a letter which was written i told us somewhere around maybe 69 ad so it is just 30 years 
uh, or so after the ascension, you know, death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Christ. So uh, the generation that was there during the time of the trial of Jesus, they were, many of them would be alive at that time and they would remember the life that Jesus lived. What kind of life did he live? He lived a life of communion with the Father. He lived a life of um, authority over the works of the devil. He lived a life of nurturing and making disciples. Okay? So all that they remember. And so he's instructing them and he's saying, he hasn't changed. Just because now he's ascended into heaven, do you think Jesus has changed? No. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and how long is he going to be the same? He's going to be the same forever. So in other words, you know, theologically, if you want to put it, one could say the immutable or uh, it can't be broken or changed. You know, the character of God, it remains the same. So Jesus is the same uh, forevermore. Uh, and, you know, that must bring a lot of confidence to the believer that, okay, even today, the Lord Jesus is my redeemer. He is, um, he is my healer. He is my deliverer. Nothing has changed. Okay, then moving on. Uh, we have to follow after this Jesus. So he says, do not be carried about with various strange doctrines. Okay, again, you see, uh, they considered the times that they lived in um, as the last days. So you would find in the writings of many of the apostles, the last days, you know, the last days. So they were also anticipating the return of Christ very eagerly. And that's when Paul writes to the Thessalonian church about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the last days, uh, we recognize that there are false prophets and false teachers and you know spirits that spread false doctrines so there is a warning for the believers even the writer of the hebrews is warning them and he's saying don't get carried about with various and strange doctrines okay something weird something that does not have an anchor in the word there are lots of such things even today if you uh, um, you you would agree with me that people um, uh, come up with new teachings. It sounds exciting in the beginning, but when you see the depth of it, you know whether there are scriptures to substantiate what this person is saying, there'll be nothing. Or there can be scriptures, but twisted. One or two scriptures here, but the way the interpretation goes, you know, it does not glorify. Uh, the Lord Jesus. It is not in agreement to the work of the Spirit. So things like that. So various and strange doctrines, even during their times, they had that. So there is a warning. Don't get carried away. When do we get carried away? When we are not anchored. Okay, so be strong in the doctrine. For it is good that the heart be established by grace. Again, you know, um, talking to the believers about the work of uh, Jesus, that we don't have to do, you know, righteous acts are not what win salvation for us. Right? Salvation is uh, by grace through faith. So remember that we don't have to earn our salvation, but we live our live out, you know, our salvation with fear and trembling. So that is always there. So he says, don't become. Uh, religious you no know, religious spirit is activities rituals just the form but no true reverence and worship in it so he says not with foods which have no pro uh, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them so you understand the jewish people they come from a background where a lot of rituals made them happy so they had a tendency to continue like that you know practice some ritual you know, it makes me feel holy, uh, maybe some um, holy food. He's saying, no, not required. What about grace then? You know, you're already saved by grace. Now, don't fall back. Go back to your old ways. Please don't do that. Uh, so then he, uh, again, you know, continues to explain about what Christ has done. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. So he says, the kind of temple 
that we belong to now there are those who are physically the jewish unbelievers okay they were still doing their offerings daily offerings all those things but he says those people have no part in what we are experiencing now okay they don't have a right to uh, eat in this real tabernacle and then again he uh, he explains and he says for the blood of animals right it's it, that is not what did the job for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp okay therefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood so you see the comparison there whatever they are doing is symbolic but the ultimate work has been done by jesus he has sanctified us with his blood uh suffered outside the gate therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city but we seek the one to come so basically you know for us to uh receive you know receive from god so outside the camp you know maybe it's kind of uh, referring to uh like a new way of doing things um earlier people were used to judaism you know a, a certain way of doing things but you know jesus he this was a new way of living so that's why outside the camp he died outside the camp he shed his blood and now we are included into a higher and a better form of worship is what uh, we are being told here so in this new way of worship which is not your typical ritualistic temple worship what kind of sacrifices are we supposed to bring verse 16 uh, we are told let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to god so praise is a sacrifice which we can offer that is the fruit of our lips okay the fruit of our lips uh, and giving thanks to his name so we may not see because mm, we no lo longer have to shed blood and do things like that so there are spiritual ways in which we can offer sacrifices so one of the ways is recorded here even in the book of peter we will see about spiritual sacrifices which we bring to god so here we have noted praise is a spiritual sacrifice then thanksgiving giving of thanks to his name is a, a way we can lift up and sacrifice to god so we ought to practice these things and again he says but do not forget to do good and to share so a uh, a uh, uh, good life you know a good life a godly life um, uh, where we are blessing others that's that's what we are called to for with such sacrifices god is well pleased so our giving is also a sacrifice okay so god is making a note of all these things that okay here are the spiritual sacrifices that are coming from the lives of uh, you know sons and daughters then obey those who rule over you now again this is um referring to leaders okay it's talking to uh, especially god leaders obey those who rule over you uh, and now rule is a way of understanding authority Okay, that they have authority doesn't necessarily mean you know like a master slave kind of ruling not like that but uh, those who have authority over you uh, earlier we saw that so obey it says or they are when they guide you please listen and follow and be submissive or in other words uh, you are yielding to what they are saying so why should you know one have a submissive attitude towards leaders because uh, we are told that they have a responsibility and their responsibility is to watch out for our souls now sometimes for us as um, followers we don't understand no, why is this leader telling me are why are they putting so many uh, restrictions and you know or we don't understand many things as we are growing up but when those who are leading 
know, by their wisdom, they guide us in a certain way. It's not to say that we have to be dumb and, you know, never, never uh, question them because that's not the kind of authority. Again, in the book of Peter and all, we'll see uh, how, how exactly to lead people in a loving way. Uh, but, you know, we, we, must give that due respect to uh, good godly leaders when they are instructing us. So we are submissive, even though at times we may not understand, you know, why should I do all this or, you know, well, I, I don't see the value in this. But still, because these leaders, God is going to hold them accountable. They watch over, watch out for our souls. So because they have to give account, they are instructing us and we have to be submissive to them. And let us do so with joy and not with grief. Okay, so uh, how will it be, you know, if those of those of us who have uh, some kind of a leadership role at the moment and uh, you're guiding people, helping people, what if they have a bad attitude and they say, I don't want to do it, but, you know, I'll do it. Now, if they do it with that sort of a resentful attitude, it's very painful, isn't it, for the leaders? But what if they are joyful? We see uh, in, in the book of Deborah at the time when they had to go fight a battle where, where people offer themselves vol as volunteers. You know, uh, Deborah sings a song. It's great when people offer themselves voluntarily. So in a joyful way, people are willing to serve God. So in the same way, over here, when people joyfully respond to the instructions of the leaders, it's a great thing. And uh, that's the attitude we too, as followers, we have to maintain towards our leaders. Now, if we do it resentfully, we are told that it is unprofitable. It is not useful. So finally, in conclusion, um, the writer asks for prayer. We see that even Paul, in the closing parts of some of his letters, he says, okay, pray for us that we may be bold. Pray for us that doors for the ministry could be open for us, things like that. So uh, it was, again, a good thing for um, people to pray for each other, especially for people to pray for leaders. So he's saying, please pray for us, you know, um, for we are confident that we have a good conscience. That's amazing for a leader to, to say that everything that the leader has done, they have done with a good conscience. And, uh, you know, this kind of testimony, even each one of us should maintain whatever we do for the people, God's people, we should do with a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. And then he says, I especially urge you to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. Or in other words, you know, he wants to visit physically you know, these uh, um, people in their region. And now the closing closing words or blessing if you want to call it he says now may the god of peace who brought up our lord jesus from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will working in you that what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay. How beautiful. So he says about our God, that he is a God of peace. And about the Lord Jesus, who is our shepherd. And Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, meaning he is a conqueror. And then you know, we are told that we uh, now have an everlasting covenant you know, with God. And we are able to do good work according to his will uh, and that we must be complete in every good work okay to do god's will uh, that's only possible because of what jesus has done otherwise we would lack the capacity but he's saying look i pray that you will complete it you will do whatever it takes to fulfill the purpose of god for your life mm. and he ultimately gives glory to the Lord Jesus. So he says, glory forever and ever. Amen.
Okay, so that's like a blessing he leaves behind. And in conclusion, the last, very, very last portion, he says, and I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Okay, so he, he's saying few words, 13 chapters. Uh, he's poured out his heart about various things to the persecuted believers. But, you know, he says few words and uh, know that our brother Timothy has been set free. So you see, they were in difficult times. Remember, we also saw he talked about prisoners. So he's saying Timothy was in prison, but now he is set free with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints, or meaning say hi to everyone. You know, that's how we would say it. So he's basically closing off the letter uh, and uh, making some last comments. And he says, uh, those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay, so grace be with you was one of their way of, uh, you know, blessing brothers and sisters across. Now, there are people based on, I told us that the author is not generally in most of the episodes, the author will give their name. But in this book, author has not given their name. So there is speculation. You know, who could this be? And there are people who say that uh, it, it was um, Paul. Okay. Now, one of the reasons people say it was Paul is this because he, he talks about Timothy, our brother Timothy. And we know that that strong relationship which Paul had was, uh, you know, with Timothy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we don't know why he has not chosen to reveal his name, maybe because of the persecution, but it's quite unusual and unlikely of Paul not to mention his name. Okay, so with that, we come to the end of the book of Hebrews. We are through with it and we can now move on to uh, 1 Peter. I'll just give us uh, some time in case you have questions or some thoughts about what you have learned from the book of Hebrews. Okay, so now we will be moving on to all the other books that we have to cover and yeah, we should be able to comfortably cover all of them. Okay, any thoughts, any comments? Or anything you liked? So in the online classes, no, it's very encouraging for us if we hear your voice. Uh, otherwise, it's like you're talking to a to a screen. And I can see your photos, but still, it's more uh, uh, encouraging if you can you know, speak, share your thoughts, and comment. That would be very nice. Ma'am, I want to say one thing. Yes, so, Kiran. Yeah, yeah, how the How Pastor Paul wrote and writes all the letters to believers and all the, the pattern, how he gave the blessing and how he explained about faith and all Old Testament example and all that all very nicely, uh, very, very blessed. And it's a little bit review from OT and New Testament. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kiran. Thank you for sharing your thoughts there. So uh, you feel it's Paul who wrote it. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's up to you, uh, but as long as we can learn from what has been said. So that's nice. Anyone else, you want to share some thoughts? And then after that, I'll move like on. The part, first uh, yes, yes. Thomas? Like the part, uh, the God will correct, like uh, the only father corrects their children. That's really awesome. He, how much he loves, shows how much he loves and how much he interested in our life. And... Uh, we, we have to accept with love and with the joy when God corrects us. That's really needed. We should not get frustrated or fed up with those things, but how the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. So he will, he's doing for us. So we will become uh, the honorable vessel. As, uh, in another scripture, it's quotes like that. No? That's, that's how the God will hold and chasten and discipline us. That's really touched me. That uh, again, if whenever I wrote the read, that portions, I can see the past love there. 
that's really amazing yeah yeah thanks thomas thank you for sharing yeah it is really everything god does is with love and that's very clear from the book of hebrews uh, especially the chastisement uh, portion there so thank you for sharing uh, anyone else your thoughts aren any anything that you want to add Can we can't hear you Aran Okay maybe uh yeah doesn't matter uh if uh, if others have something to share you can and we'll move on to first speaker Okay I think we'll move on to first speaker Yeah great so class you can go back review hebrews you know read it over and over again and uh, each time you learn something new from it and it establishes you in the powerful work that jesus has done so when you understood these things it's not easy to get carried away how he says right don't get carried away with the uh, various and strange doctrines so if you are anchored in christ and uh, his work then uh, we will be strong and it's so important especially uh, in the times that we live in with all kinds of teachings going around now let's move on to the book of first peter so you can turn to first peter uh, in your bibles okay so as you see the the name of the epistles uh, have the name of the author okay. so there are two epistles which peter wrote and uh, it has first peter second peter we uh, recognize that this was a letter which he wrote from a place called babylon uh, and we also know that peter was a fisherman so you don't expect him to uh, be proficient in language okay uh, yes he used to uh, make sermons he used to uh, preach the word but when it came to writing uh, we are not sure you know how good he was and so uh, he took the help of silas to write these epistles okay uh, and the pattern is our usual pattern that paul follows where uh, the author will give the name first and then you know proceed so apparently those days they would write on scrolls scrolls and um, you wouldn't have the patience to open the entire scroll to go to the end these days in our letters we will write at the end of the letter uh, but you know sometimes the scrolls are very big so first they'll give the name of the author okay i am the one who's writing it and then continue with the content this um, is a we are the ones who have divided it into sections and chapters and all for um, ease of understanding and you know communication but we know when peter wrote it he didn't write it like that so there's a flow of thoughts uh, and when you look at the content you would find that similar to hebrews there is doctrine who we are in christ and what is our inheritance and all those things so there is doctrine Uh, there is also instruction lots and lots of instruction for christian life uh, we will see that there is a mention of duties so a master this is how you should be a slave this is how you should be a wife this is how you should be so there are christian um, duties as well that you could talk about and uh, that is included uh, in uh, peter's instruction when was this written it is again traced back to roughly the same duration as uh, hebrews uh, it was a time of persecution and also a time when 
the persecution under nero was i mean uh, it it was going to pick up and we know that after 70 ad there was a destruction of the temple and so many things happened so it was that sort of a, a transitional time when believers across were going through uh, a very rough time that peter also wrote this epistle okay. and it is written in greek language uh, and there is uh, uh, he has used the present tense when he talks about temple and sacrifices and all of that uh, so that is the reason you know people say okay that means that uh, the temple was still there because the greek is in present tense uh, and therefore you know it should be before 70 ad because after 70 ad the temple was uh, destroyed so uh, that's how you look at it uh who were the people who he was writing to you would see that uh they were those who whom he ministered to in the region of asia minor in in chapter 1 you will see the regions their names are mentioned and uh, uh it was written to uh you know some places they say primarily gentiles but other places they say jews and gentiles so you know we 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 will um see the kind of instructions that he gives there so jews and gentiles you could uh, look at it that way so you don't necessarily have um, uh the manner of speaking that the writer of the hebrews used he was referring to the old covenant and uh, it he has said uh, he said you are my son the psalms so it's an assumption that your listener is already aware and uh, the tabernacle the portions of the tabernacle now a gentile will not understand all these things so it's quite clear that it is being spoken to the jewish audience but in this case it, it's not that um you know that uh, uh jewish in the way it is written so it could it is written to uh, the gentiles and of course you know the jews also could gain from what peter wrote and what was the purpose of the letter the purpose of the letter was encouragement so as i told you the time in which they lived persecution was increasing and there was anticipated persecution from nero in the days to come you know emperor nero so uh, the hearts of the people was being prepared they would have been so discouraged uh, with the attitude of of people around so you know even in daily living issues are addressed uh, how should you be towards a, a very harsh uh, you know master maybe people are very harsh to the christians at that time but peter addresses all those things and he says come on you know your ultimate uh, thing is that your faith is in god and so you must maintain a good spirit and you must serve well all that you know he he includes in this letter so it's encouragement and he says in the midst of persecution you must still live a righteous life so he will begin uh, uh, first peter chapter 1 you will see that he will start by explaining to the believer who a believer is you know how they have this inheritance in god which is uh, which is unperishable and uh, their position in christ jesus so when you when you are reminded of the fact that that is who you are then there is a lot of encouragement to live right because we are not from this kingdom which will pass away but we are living we are part of the unperishable kingdom and we know that we will receive a reward for the righteous life that we uh, live for the sake of christ so it's basically a letter of great encouragement to the persecuted and jesus is the focus you know uh, for the believers and we will see later on you know that he will encourage the believers that uh, you think you're going through so much of persecution but just the way the writer of the hebrews he said looking unto jesus you know we can't have a better example of a person who has gone through so much pain and still been submitted to god you know like a son joyfully saying yes to the purposes of god like jesus and so 
we are encouraged that come on you know if jesus could do it you can do it you can carry a very positive attitude as you go through uh, the challenges so let's start off uh, we have roughly about 5 minutes but it's okay we will just begin and uh, then we will continue from here so uh, we see here that he says uh, peter uh, an apostle of jesus christ so introduction self introduction then to the pilgrims of the dispersion in pontus galatia cappadocia asia and bithynia so audience or you know how in the letter to from so from is is peter to is all these believers now they are uh, distributed across a certain regions and sorry this region is also a gentile region okay so there are gentiles living there and uses the term pilgrims you know pilgrim is a stranger now you have people who go to a religious place to visit and you know worship and then what do they do they come back such people are known as pilgrims so the way peter is looking at the believer is that we are actually citizens of heaven but we are here in the world temporarily and that is why he calls the believers as pilgrims or sojourners sojourners also are people who are traveling and they decide to uh, stay back in the city and route for some time they are sojourners so he refers to the believers as travelers you are on a journey to heaven which is our real place of citizenship so believer uh, know that you are in the world but not of the world that is the way he is looking at it so he is writing primarily to these gentile regions and dispersion is um the believers were spread across okay uh, all these places because he had he has he had ministered in these places and you see the apostles what they did was once they had followers they didn't just forget them but they wanted to make sure that these followers become disciples in every way that they are taught the doctrine they are taught the ways of christian life so on and so forth and that is why they are writing to them now look at this all this he is addressing the the believers he called them pilgrims now he says elect according to the four knowledge of god elect he calls them elect what is elect elect is picked out chosen or in our language we would say vip you know we you have some seats in a, a program which are set aside for the vips so elect that is the elect elect according to the foreknowledge of god or god uniquely chose you is what he is saying and then he you know goes on to uh, saying that the election involves sanctification or the cleansing that comes from god purification or consecration that leads to obedience okay and the believers are cleansed from sin through the sprinkling of the blood of jesus sprinkling of blood was practiced by uh, the believers for in various things so they understood that but he is letting them know that this position was brought to you by what jesus has done and uh, uh you know he calls them elect so sometimes based on the scripture there is a question you know does it mean that god has already pre decided who is going to be part of the kingdom you know it's not like that it is like saying that um, anyone who comes to uh, anyone let's say there is a door it says you know um uh, for the elect now anyone is allowed to become the elect you can enter okay. and uh, so it's not god who's saying okay you be elect or you be elect because we know that jesus died for the whole world and so the whole world has an opportunity to be part of this election okay. so anyone 
who believes in Christ can become a child of God. Now, of course, we also understand that God already knew who would make this choice of becoming his children. So let's stop at this point. We will continue. We will pick up, go through First Peter in the next class. So can somebody please pray and we will close today's uh, uh, class. Maybe Kiran? Yes, ma'am, sir. Yeah, sure. Father God, we come before your throne, Father God, once again. And we want to say thanking you, Father God, for all and everything, Father God. Thanking you. Thanking you, Father God, to giving us the wisdom and knowledge, Father God, that we are nicely, Father God, by the God days, Father God. We are understanding the subject, Father God. Thanking you, Father God. Reveal more things, Father God, that we can receive from you and we can apply to your kingdom, for Father God. Thanking you. Bless to all students. Bless to Nancy, ma'am. And lead to your kingdom way, Father God. Thanking you. Rest of the day, submitting to your hand. Take care of every side. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, everyone. So, okay. Yeah, God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, bye. We'll meet next week.